Hmm. You know what, officer? No, there's definitely no cool crimes happening in this house. Bye! Sucker. Cue the music. Cue the overambitious grading. There's actually no one else here. I'm completely alone, but for once, that's a good thing. Welcome to my negotiation special episode. Do you remember our review of Chinatown, where I talked about my love of brokering cool deals at your dining table? I still love that game, still love that review, because while the average human is 58% water, I'm 58% hot air. Today, I am so excited to say that you and I will be discovering if there's another negotiation classic to be found in three different games. Gentleman's Deal, HMS Dolores, and Millions of Dollars. Three games from three different designers that are all coincidentally about dividing up the loot after a cool crime. Although before we proceed, I should state that Shut Up and Sitting Down doesn't endorse cool crimes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we're going to be reviewing these games from least to most interesting, and that means starting with Gentleman's Deal. Costume change. What's the matter? You're acting like you've never seen a criminal before. So Gentleman's Deal transforms between five and nine players into a table of small town criminals. Criminals who aren't just unafraid of the law, they control the law. And how do they control the law? Like a puppet on strings. And what are those strings made of? Crime! Each one of you is going to be making money, lying, and slipping in and out of jail as if it were a backpacker's hostel. The winner is whoever can make the most money in about half an hour, and the game is exquisitely simple to teach. On your turn, you draw a card showing you, and only you, how much money you've earned from your latest crooked business deal. But to get that money, you need to pay your friends to look the other way. And that's a problem, because they're all going to be staring at you like grimy little opossums in car headlights, rubbing their sticky paws. When it's your turn to deal, and after you've drawn the card, you're gonna take as much money as you can bear to give away, and you'll start handing it out. Putting in front of your friend's screams, and you'll think three for you, one for you, cause you're winning, two for you. You do this in silence, and then you open the floor to negotiations. Civil, nice, calm negotiate. No, it's just gonna be one of your friends going, I need more money than this, you nobbling, loving and then you're gonna listen or not, and after you've heard everyone or not, you get to do one more round of giving out money. Again, in silence, going, okay, you get one more, you get one less, you get two more, and then all the players except you vote on whether the deal goes ahead. And that's a bit complicated, because when you're this shady, democracy involves unregistered firearms. So you do three, two, one, vote. All the other players, if they put their thumb up, that's a yes for your deal. Thumb down, that's a no for your deal. Gun up, spending one of your three firearm tokens yet for the whole game, is three votes for yes, and cool criminal gun down is three votes for no. Now, if the deal goes through, if the majority of votes are four, or if it's a tie, everyone gets all that money that they were promised. You then reveal the deal card and take everything on it you didn't give out, which could be massive. But don't get too greedy, because if the deal is voted down, if the majority of players say no, not only does no one get anything and play moves on, but you go to prison and you get no vote in the next deal. It's as if you're on a night out and you suggested something so awful that everyone went home and you temporarily cease to exist. <laughs> Muddying the maths of Gentleman's Deal and keeping the game confusing and interesting are these friend, accomplice, bastard cards. Every single deal card also lets you redistribute three of the bastard cards, including the, uh, the tycoon who gets an extra dollar every time a deal goes through if you have the tycoon, the sheriff who lets you make two dollars every time anyone goes to jail, and the journalist who makes a dollar every time your neighbors or you use a gun, which means you might shoot somebody to sell a few extra newspapers. This is the worst town. But you want to visit, don't you? 
That's actually the whole game, but the devil's in the details when it comes to Gentleman's Deal. I mean, thematically, the devil's everywhere. You are wearing the devil like a rubbery Kigurumi, but it's all these ragged, sharp little details that make this game worth your money. The rule that each dealer only gets two chances to redistribute money is brilliant, because not only does it keep the game fast, it makes it impossible because you're trying to give each player the minimum amount, but you only get one chance to distribute money to everyone and test the waters and then you get one more chance and for the love of God, don't overpay because then you've wasted your turn. Like a good knife. Gentleman's deal is not flashy, but when it's balanced and sharp, it gets the job done, you know? It is possible in this game to count how much money everyone has, but you'll just fail at that. It's possible to use your gun tokens at exactly the right time to push a deal through, but you'll fail at that too. It's possible to ascertain the value of all the different roll cards, and you'll fail at that. But you will have failed because your instinct was wrong, and that is a lot of fun. I'm not uh, one of those knife weirdos, by the way. This was my dad's knife. I just like to hold it and sharpen it. So, Gentleman's Deal is by no means an amazing game, but it doesn't have to be because there's a shortage of good negotiation games out there and also because so much of the flash and flair in negotiation games can come from your friends. The first time I played Gentleman's Deal, something that we did multiple times that was so good is you redistribute out all your money and then Maybe you give this player four dollars and you promise them a roll and that player during negotiation goes, oh, I want six dollars and God, that moustache, six dollars and two rolls. And you listen to them and you go, mm, OK, man, yeah, I've taken that on board. And then during redistribution, you take everything in front of them and give that to someone else and they get nothing and your friends all laugh and then guns come out during the deal so you've spent your friends gun tokens which is good because it improves your negotiation power and everyone laughs and ooh, oh it's good. I would say the only real problem with Gentleman's Deal apart from the laughably crap money which is the poorest effort I've seen a publisher make on anything in all of 2016 is that it requires at least five players, it's what, five to nine? which isn't ideal. But not to worry, because the next game we're looking at is for a svelte two to four players. Costume change! What's the matter? Never seen a cool 18th century Cornish criminal before. So this next game is actually a collaboration between none other than Eric Lang and Bruno Faiduti, two storied game designers. And it's about, actually, I find what it's about incredibly sad. Wrecking was the historic practice by coastal communities of lighting fires on stormy nights that ships would then think are lighthouses, causing them to misjudge where they were and go plowing into rocks, killing all hands, but letting the locals recover all of the cargo as if a department store had just washed up on their beach. And the darkest part is that if there were any survivors, they were legally entitled to the flotsam. So if any of the crew were lucky enough to wash up on the beach and they're gasping for air, and oh, thank God I'm alive. The wreckers would then sometimes drown them in a few inches of surf. Anyway, let's go have some fun. There isn't much haul in this here crate. Just one deck of precious cargo to divide up and a dawn card hidden towards the bottom of the deck telling you it's time to go home and cram all your ill-gotten gains under your bed, in your fridge, or just panic and burn it. That's what I would do. The winner is the person at the end with the most points worth of stuff. But this loot scores weirdly. So there are seven different beautifully illustrated categories of loot in Dolores. Let's say you got all this good stuff at the end of a game. Here's the thing though, you're only actually gonna score the group you have the most of and the least of. So in this case, we get one point for the guns and two, three, one, six points for the wine. But, and this is the rule that powers the lorries, like you plugged it into the box like a little double A battery. If groups tie for most, then you score all of them. So we'd get two points of lace, two points of guns, six points of silverware, six points of wine. That would be our total score. And coincidentally, we'd have everything you need for a traditional Cornish party. As the game starts, you and your friends have all wrecked this ship, the Dolores, uh, and you're gonna try and divide up all the cargo, but actually the game is technically called the HMS Dolores, which stands for Her Majesty's Ship, 
which is a prefix only used by Sweden and England. So technically, this game should have just been called Dolores. Uh, that would... Hi, Queens. You're not being boring, are you? <laughs> no, I was just talking about a uh, cool crime I did once. <laughs> Did I say a cool crime I didn't, haven't done, didn't, please don't call the police. So Dolores is a game where you're trying to get loads of cards, but more importantly, you're trying to make sure your sets are of equal numbers. Easy, except not so easy because getting all cards in Dolores means navigating the treacherous reef of your friend's goodwill. You are about to, as the kids say, get wrecked. As for the actual game in Dolores, it goes round in a circle. I am going to trade with the player on my right, then I'm going to trade with the player on my left, then that player is going to trade with the player on their left, and then so on, going round and round. Which means that some players in three or four player games aren't playing. And that's fine, because the negotiations in Dolores are the equivalent of a cage match. They are a great spectator sport. So let's say I'm trading with the player on my right. As always, we deal out four cards, and always in a grid. And then we're going to talk for however many seconds or minutes, and then we're going to throw out a symbol. If you both throw out a share, you each Three. take the two cards on your side of the table. If someone plays a punch One. to a share, the person Three. who punches takes everything. If two people punch One. each other, Two. nobody gets Three. anything and everything is discarded. Players who throw out the leave symbol get to take one card first. So if you play a leave to a share, you can take any one card, then the sharer gets what's left on their half of the square. If you sh take one card to a punch, you get one card, the other player gets everything. But, interestingly, if you both throw out shares, not only do neither of you get anything, but you both have to discard one of your sets of goods. This is a mean little onion of a game. It's just layers upon layers upon layers. It's quite bitter initially, and it's gonna make someone cry, but it's also quite small. If you've ever played the Game of Thrones board game, you know that thing where someone's your mortal enemy for an hour, and then they, you're in an alliance for an hour, and then you hate them again. Dolores is like that, except you're friendly for five minutes, and then you hate each other, and you're just trying to screw each other over for five minutes. And then you hate someone else for one minute. It's ridiculous. So the discussions in Dolores aren't actually that interesting. I mean, it's one player saying, oh, I quite want this, and another going, oh, I won't quite want this, and then both thinking about it. But what's so good, and what makes this game great, and I think you could easily buy this one as well, is what happens after the negotiation. Something laughably common is this. One, two, wait, 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 wait. Okay. What? Wait. It's ridiculous, because the more honest you are in your negotiations, the better the tool you're giving your opponent to, when it really matters, just take the cards or give the cards that will ruin your score. The more reliably you say, I'm going to throw out this, and you do, or any symbol, then the better groundwork you're laying for your opponent screwing you over later. And it's not zero sum either, which makes negotiations so hard and so good, because yes, you can screw me over, but it just means you'll have a worse negotiation for the rest of the game. And it all leads to something so funny, which is two players routinely will both agree to throw out one symbol, and then when it comes to it, they will both throw out a completely different symbol, either because they were too afraid of getting screwed over, or they were never planning to throw that symbol out in the first place, and ah, ah, it is a good game. It's not a perfect game, but then, you know, what is? Uh, I would say that the two to four player count on the box is actually wrong. I don't think it works with two, but I think it does work with five. So I call this a three to five player game. The bigger problem with it is that it needs friends who can bite into that onion like an apple and enjoy themselves. Because you don't want people who are going to get upset when they are inevitably betrayed and their score collapses and all the other people playing burst out laughing at them, which is not going to be everybody. Now, I've saved the best for last. Let's move on to the coolest negotiation game I've got for you today. I'm wobbling. Let's do another costume change and let's look at millions of dollars. So with the release of millions of dollars, Matigo has become my favorite board game publisher of 2016. First, they give us the sublime submarine combat game, Captain Sonar followed by the weird and wonderful world of Inish, a game of warring Irish tribes. And now we get not one, but millions of dollars. Another game that's beautiful and different, 
and I live for both of those things. Three to eight players each represent a gang of criminals, some of which are damn cool, some of which are less cool, some are trying way too hard to be cool, and one of which are is some clowns? Each banknote also says one million of dollars on it. The point is you're gonna be laughing even before you've started playing, and you'll be laughing a lot after that too. So you've got eight rounds to see who can make the most of the millions of dollars, but each round starts the same. Everyone pays an ante and without talking, selects one roll to send on the heist. Either your thug, your driver, your crook, your mastermind, or your snitch. Then all those cards you put in are shuffled up, one is hidden, and the rest are delves face up. And then the game begins. At this point, players are going to start dropping out, probably because other players are paying them to drop out. Because... Duplicate rolls that go on the heist don't get paid. So, if the table's final team that goes on the heist is a driver, a crook, and two masterminds, the two masterminds are both eliminated, and the driver and the crook get to split what's coming for you guys in the bank. And hopefully, that is more money than they paid to other players to drop out. But it's more complicated than that. No one ever said that making millions of dollars would be easy. So if you're the only criminal who makes it to the end of a heist and you get some money, you also get a special power. Masterminds increase the take by two million and are beloved. Drivers demand one million in payment from everyone else on the heist and are loathed. Crooks steal two million of dollars from the heist's thug, if there is one. The thug gets a card that they can use on a later round to peek at someone's identity, which is a bit underwhelming until you realize that if you use it at the right time, you can charge that player hush money if they don't want anyone to know who they are. And finally, there's snitches. If there's a lone snitch on the heist, their power is to pick any other visible class of criminal on the heist with them and eliminate that criminal. Except if they're the only person left on the heist, rather than getting the entire take, they get none of it because they're arrested and have to pay three million of dollars as bail. Hey, you didn't hear it from me, but that crook's in the address I gave you earlier. Guess that makes me the boss now. Did I, did, did I say that I was a criminal? Cause I'm not that, my LinkedIn? No, I, I can't imagine why it would say I'm an expert on cool crimes. And if this sounds like a difficult thing to try and suss out the actual game of and then negotiate and then win, you're completely right. Like Inish, it takes a bit of time to figure out the game here, but let me just give you an example. Future. If you um, don't snitch on me, I will give you a million dollars next turn. So your highest bid is the lowest possible bid. Yes. That's what you're going for. It's also the only <laughs> bid you've got. Can, so you, can you give me two? <laughs> Half an I, don't, I don't want him. So the cards are turned up and it's snitch, driver, driver, thug, crook, and then that mystery card. And you know one of the drivers is you. So there's a good argument for announcing to the table that you're one of those drivers and that you'll pay the other driver to drop out or take money from them. And that's an interesting discussion. You could also pay the thug to drop out because since the crook is in play, if they both go through to the end, the crook will steal from the thug. So if you pay the thug to drop out, the thug never gets robbed and you get a bigger fraction of the take and the crook gets a bit less. So that's an interesting discussion too, but don't forget that snitch, because the snitch is going to eliminate someone and the last thing you want is to pay all these people, go on the heist, and then the snitch eliminates you and you get nothing and you paid all that money out and you're in the hole. So maybe stay quiet there. And then there's that mystery card as well. And whatever that role is, whoever that player is, that's gonna throw all your discussions into disarray. Of course it will. And of course, it could also be you. So now I've given you that example, you're getting it, right? You're starting to see the game. Now, I want you to imagine that the cards are flipped and it's mastermind, mastermind, driver, snitch, or snitch, 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 driver, crook. You know, whatever it is, the round's gonna play out completely differently and it represents a different puzzle. And that is the game. And better yet, the game is gonna play out differently depending on not just how many people you play it with and what roles show up, but which role you pick. Playing a snitch is nothing like playing a thug, is nothing like playing a mastermind, is nothing like playing a driver. And now this isn't a perfect game either. One problem that we encountered is that 
Because the game ends when someone hits 20 millions of dollars, the paper money the game comes with is a little flimsy. That's eminently fixable by replacing the paper money with poker chips. That's great and chips feel great, but you could also use, you know, grapes or actual cash, whatever you have lying around, actual millions of dollars. Who am I to judge your life? Uh, there's also the fact that the game's just a bit inscrutable because really what we've got here is a hidden role game that then becomes a negotiation game with a terrifying game of chicken waiting for you at the end like a awful poultry based dessert and millions of dollars is meant to be hard and meant to be a bit inscrutable but players might not have a t good time if they don't play many board games and they can't quite unpick the game here might be a little complex for your gaming group if your gaming group when faced with a challenge probably just want to give up and play something simpler you're probably right, but if your gaming group really enjoys unpicking difficult puzzles and getting the best of each other in ways that you hadn't even imagined were possible, Millions of Dollars will be your favourite of the three games we've looked at today, and it is absolutely my favourite. So there you have it, ladies and gents. In a twist ending, I would recommend any one of these three games. Gentleman's Deal, an excellent simple game for big groups, Dolores, an excellent sharp nasty little game for small groups and millions of dollars. Definitely the weirdest, definitely the hardest to play, but the one I think has the most magic to it. Hmm. Hey, if these negotiation games could have a conversation with each other, what do you think they'd negotiate about? Should we find out? Oh no! Officer, I need to report a cool crime. 